little introduction thing to take up <laughs> the space. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome back to session two. Um, our first speaker isn't here, so we're going to jump ahead and have Jason Levitt present in a minute. But my name is Alicia Bentley, and I'll be your session chair today. Um, this session is 20-minute slots, so that's 17-minute talks. And I'll um, let our speakers know they have two minutes left at 15 minutes. And Jason, if you are available, and I should double check. Oh, good. Okay. Well, whichever we want. Tara, do you want to go in the order that we are on the schedule? Um, um, no, let, let's go ahead and, and if Jason's ready to go, let's okay. have Jason. All right. So our first speaker will be Jason Levitt from NOAA EMC, and he'll be presenting development and planning of the new Environmental Modeling Center Verification System, or EVS. Okay, thanks. I think this should all work. <laughs> kind of scrambling here for a second. There we go. Okay, um, uh, just to check, you can see everything correctly yeah, and hear me all right? Great. Okay, good. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's great to see this workshop going on, this Met Plus workshop. Um, lots of great talks planned and a, and a, a great schedule. So I uh, hope you're all enjoying uh, the first day of the workshop. Uh, I'll be talking, as Alicia mentioned, about our new uh, verification system that we're developing here um, at EMC, which uses uh, MET Plus as its core. So uh, you'll, you'll get an introduction here to, to what we're doing and, and how we're going to be employing the results from the metrics workshop that occurred uh, a, a couple years ago, uh, last year, and, uh, and, and employing the, the core of, uh, of MET Plus to our new verification system. So just a quick overview of the branch here at EMC, if you don't know too much about it. Uh, this is the, the uh, post-processing, uh, verification post-processing and project generation branch. Uh, basically, uh, two different components. Uh, verification and validation does independent model evaluations. We have the model evaluation group, which Alicia and, and others uh, are part of uh, here in the workshop uh, that evaluate all of our models. And we do real-time verification, which we're going to focus on here for, for uh, this talk. And of course, we do our post-processing and products as well, too. We manage the UPP. Several of you probably know what that is, Unified Post-Processor, Aviation Products, and we manage all the model output that goes out to the world in terms of our products. So uh, a lot to do in this team. Uh, but I'm going to be covering today the verification side. What is the EVS? Uh, it will simply just stands for the Environmental Modeling Center Verification System. A uh, very simple acronym for a lot of things that are going on with this piece of software. So the idea behind this is that we're going to be creating a real-time monitoring system for all operational EMC models with this EVS. What's been going on behind the scenes for the past several years at EMC when it comes to verification is um, it's kind of been done ad hoc and in a lot of different types of components, either with customized software or off-the-shelf software. A, a lot of different pieces of software are being used to verify our models. This is going to bring it all under one umbrella to an operational verification system. So uh, just to give you an example of why we decided to do this. So quite often when we have a, a supercomputer switch from one supercomputer to another, so our backup becomes primary and our primary becomes backup, uh, the verification system that's running is primarily running on the developmental side, which is our backup machine. When that switches, uh, we have to scramble to do a lot of work to get everything working on the primary system, uh, the new primary system. And so that means all of our graphics generation and some of our stats generation uh, don't uh, uh, take a while to get updated. So it'll take maybe a few days to get updated, um, especially if it happens over a weekend. Uh, so. Uh, that means we've got to create this new real-time system, which will allow us to do verification in real-time. This will uh, eventually run in real-time next year. We're planning on having this implemented on WCOS2 uh, sometime next summer or maybe next fall. That means it's going to generate all the stats for all of our modeling systems and for all of our product generation systems, and will create stats and graphics that will go to the EMC website in real time. So like what uh, one of the bottom bullets says there, it takes the performance monitoring software that we're doing, that strategy, and brings it under a single umbrella and a single application rather than being distributed amongst many different applications. And it will replace a lot of the legacy software that we have running in operations right now. Uh, and then, and the, like I mentioned, the other customized software as well, too. Uh, so the idea behind this is kind of what I mentioned, is when we switched from supercomputers, uh, this can be an issue because when it's not available to developers, uh, when they have it shut down or we switch from primary to backup, we lose uh, several days worth of, of generating that, the, the real-time stats and the graphics. 
And then also, this will also reduce our, our O&M overhead as well in terms of operations and maintenance for the verification system because we're bringing it under one single application rather than having it spread across several different pieces of software. And the other thing that we wanted to do was take the results of the metrics workshop that we had last year and modernize our verification system for the UFS era, for the unified forecast system era, and uh, bring that all into uh, one system that we can use to verify all of the UFS applications that will be going into EMC operations over the next several years. What you see below is a graphic of our new uh, EMC web page. And eventually, once this is in production, those web pages, uh, which have a lot of graphics right now, will have even more from the results of the metrics workshop. And that's all being created uh, behind the scenes right now um, as the software is being developed. What makes a metric important and uh, how does it get included in the EVS? And certainly how did it get cold in the metrics workshop? Well, you'll hear a lot about that over the next uh, course of the next few days, results from the metrics workshop. But basically it should really be informative. It should be a metric that tells you about the performance of the system in some way shape or form, should also assist with improving the forecast model, making sure that uh, we've got a metric that can be measured and that can be improved down the road with better dynamic cores, better physics, better DA, something that we can use to do that as we, uh, as we move into the UFS era. And then uh, a big sentence here, but it should examine how reliable the forecast is, the resolution, discrimination, and sharpness of the model forecast, which goes all the way back to a lot of the seminal papers from the 80s and 90s that Murphy wrote, uh, that uh, if you're in the, the verification business and forecast measuring business, you know about a lot of these papers. And we also need to have a real world observation to measure against, even though we might be forecasting a certain variable in the model, and we need to measure that and verify it. And if we don't have uh, some sort of uh, data to verify against is going to be really difficult. And so that's why perhaps some of the metrics from the metrics workshop uh, won't make it into the EVS because we simply don't have either the output coming from the model or we have a viable verification source that we can verify against. It also needs to be computationally feasible and technically feasible and implementable. So uh, when we talk about putting the EVS on the WCOS2, it needs to fit within the nodes and the processors and the memory and disk space that we're given. If we uh, get something from the metrics workshop that uh, is likely going to be too much, we'll take too much I.O. or, or disk or computational overhead, we, we have to pair that back. And we've had a lot of discussions within the UFS VUB working group to do that. Uh, the other thing that uh, I know a lot of you that maybe have heard me give this talk before or heard me speak over the past few years about metrics is they need to be community vetted and peer reviewed. Uh, this is a collaborative effort that shouldn't just be one center or, or one group that is saying this is the metric that should be used. We should all work on this together as a community. And we did in the, in the metrics workshop. What you see over on the right is this idea with the unified forecast system, these stages and gates, and something that's being worked on right now by UFS leadership, where we kind of have this broad gate where maybe only a few metrics are used in terms of a lower technical readiness level at step one. And then as we go down that funnel to step four, where we get ready for implementation into EMC operations, then there's more metrics that are used to measure a higher technical readiness level and to get it ready for operations to make sure that we really truly are covering either keeping the same performance or getting a better performance out of the model or a negotiated downgrade if we need to uh, because we're improving on something else. So that kind of broad funnel as we go down is, is being discussed uh, quite a bit within the UFS community about which metrics would be used at stages one, two, three, and four, and how that would, would work its way down. For EMC, we're pretty much at stage four. So a lot of what we're going to be doing for the EVS will be looking at the, the broad spectrum of all the metrics that came out of the workshop. Um, over on the left is, is quite, a, quite a bit about um, how this should be used for, for making uh, evidence-based decision-making, uh, for making decisions, and I won't read all of this, but uh, basically, it, to me, the, the, the top goal, the, the top bullet is, is really what we're focusing on with the EVS, you know, identifying the goals of verification, what we need to do with the metrics, and the questions that we really need to answer. And for us here at EMC, that's going to be the main question is, is this really ready for operations? Does this really cover everything that we need uh, to be able to say, yes, this is a, a, a new model that we need to put into ops, and it covers either keeping the same performance or 
better performance uh, as uh, as the research has been done and, and things have been moved into uh, into an R to O framework through the stages and gates. So uh, a, a big job for the verification system to be able to do. Uh, the the metrics workshop that we had uh, two years ago was, was a year and a half ago was great. Uh, we were able to have a, a great three days. Uh, as as this says, lots of discussion, but still not enough. Uh, the idea behind what we're doing with the EVS is taking the uh, results from all of these breakout groups and these report out groups, and we took them, called them, put them in spreadsheets. You'll hear a lot about that um, over over a lot of talks, and and tried to uh, map that into something that could be used in terms of something like our, our forecast uh, or our, our EVS system and, and with uh, verifying all the forecasts uh, coming out of the UFS models. So how do we connect that to that metrics list uh, to the EVS? Uh, well, uh, we, we took the, the initial results and then we had a lot of discussion in the background. It took us about nine months or so to go from the metrics workshop to basically a, a, a verified project plan for the EVS as we took the results from that and met with a bunch of different groups in the community, subject matter experts, uh, which included uh, academia, uh, federal government, uh, private sector, everybody across the board that we had to go to and say, okay, here was this initial list. Uh, we met internally with an EMC quite a bit and thought about, well, here's where some gaps exist. And then we took that back to the UFS VNV working group, a lot of work within that working group to reach out to different SMEs and kind of call that list into uh, a pretty big document that we have here at EMC. I think it's up to 137 pages now of a lot of different metrics and graphics that are going to be produced. Um, what you see on the bottom are just some examples that I took uh, just randomly from the planning document where we have uh, these uh, rows and columns and tables worth of all the different metrics that we're going to use for different modeling systems. So just for example, there there's a, a measurement of precipitation from one of the models and it has the spatial characteristics of metric, temporal, the regions we're going to be using, the verification source, what type of uh, verification is it grid to grid, grid to ops, things like that. And then down below is an example of one of the graphics rows where for two meter temperature, the model is the HRF and the type of graphic that we're going to do a 2D line plot, uh, the different regions, the period that we're going to cover. Uh, this took an enormous amount of work. Uh, myself and the rest of the, the team here at EMC worked, uh, like I said, for about nine months to put that list together. And it's, it's uh, fairly historic here at EMC to put something like that uh, together where we're literally going to be covering all EMC applications and product systems as well too, not just things like the GFS, and the NAM, but also the NAFES and CCPA and some of the other product systems that we're developing. And of course, as the UFS evolves and as we move towards uh, the RFS and the uh, the HAFS, the new hurricane system, uh, we'll be replacing the HWARF and HMON and all of the different regional systems in the EVS with monitoring those new systems as they come online as well too. But what this does is it helps us establish a baseline of what we have now versus what's coming in terms of the new UFS applications. In terms of the workflow and design, um, we're really trying to be very transparent about what we're doing here. And so you can see that we have uh, uh, the, the code is going into GitHub. Uh, we're using MetPlus as the basis for everything that we're doing. It's going to be put on WCOS2, highly documented, pretty much developed in Python, especially in terms of the graphics, and then connecting to the WCOS2 as a, as a library system to generate the stats. We'll generate the stats files for models. This will be really configurable, modular. Uh, we'll be able to have different components and pieces. So when we do need to replace something like the wrap and the her with the RFS, we could just simply insert it and remove out the other components. So modern software design, like uh, like the third side, the, the third column says modular per model, be able to configure it. It'll be able to run in real time or offline via command line. And that's because some of the graphics and stats that we need to generate are either done quarterly or yearly. We don't need that to run an operation. So we can do that uh, by hand. And so uh, to reduce down the risk of something failing in operations, we're gonna remove some of those things from the real time component of EVS so that we're uh, ensured that we're, we're able to do that. Uh, graphics will be created using uh, common Python tools, and then it'll be integrated into the EMC website so that it's uh, clear and transparent to the public and any other stakeholders that want to come see and monitor our, uh, our performance in, in terms of how we're doing with our new models and then also with our uh, models that are running in parallel as well too. So 
uh, we're, uh, we're actively developing this right now um, as, as we speak. Um, there are, uh, there are uh, GitHub commits occurring and uh, there are uh, folks that are diligently working on this. We're hoping to have an alpha test for the system uh, done by December 1st of this year and then hopefully an implementation, like I said, next summer or fall of next year in 2023. Uh, so, like I mentioned before, we're going to be consolidating down a lot of these forecast systems into individual components, and this is really where the UFS uh, will, or, uh, sorry, the EVS will shine for the UFS uh, operational systems that are running um, in ops, because we'll be able to generate real-time stats files so that we'll be able to compare those metrics with new UFS applications that are coming in parallel. And my hope is that down the road, the development systems that are being done for the UFS will be able to use components of the EVS uh, to, uh, to do testing. Uh, but that remains to be seen in terms of how that will be coordinated with the different application teams and uh, with um, and integrated into workflows. Uh, but for right now, uh, one of the main things we need to do here, of course, within the verification team um, is to verify our current operational models first uh, so that we get a baseline performance. And that's what the EVS uh, will help us do. Two minutes. Uh, so primarily the users of the EVS here within EMC are going to be the model evaluation group and they continuously evaluate model performance. We were evaluating a lot even this spring uh, when there wasn't a lot of parallels running. We were evaluating the results coming off of WCOS2, which is going to go live tomorrow. So our brand new supercomputers go live tomorrow unless we have a critical weather day for severe weather or a tropical storm. Uh, so we were verifying the models uh, as they were coming off of WCOS2, making sure they matched or were very close to us coming off of WCOS1. Whenever we have a field evaluation, the MAG group will do that and they'll use the results from the EVS coming up over the next several years and beyond uh, to be able to um, validate the, the current models and the parallel models as well. So we'll have a one-to-one -one match in the metrics and then creating new verification techniques and developing web pages and graphics and that's all about uh, the EVS so that's what the, the mega is up to right now uh, just to get to my last slide here before I'll have time a couple minutes for questions uh, what's our upcoming plans well like I said we want to try to transition mostly to, to met plus and EVS by 2023 once we get to 25 we're hoping that we're, we're really full on met plus that we've got uh, basically maybe EVS version two at that point as different components of MetPlus also mature along the same path and visualization tools and the software is mainly complete. So visualization tools that mean things like Python using MetView or MetExpress where needed. And then from there on, we really want to try to shift some of our focus as the EVS becomes mature and the, the UFS becomes mature with, with measuring its, its performance using the EVS and, and MetPlus into doing some research into new metrics. And we know that uh, one of the things that we like to focus on will be process-oriented metrics and diagnostics, which I think is kind of the next step uh, for our verification systems to move beyond some of the basic statistics that we have into process-oriented metrics. So we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, dive into that in the future and make that part of uh, EVS 3 and 4 versions three and four as we uh, round out close to the end of the decade. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and conclude and say thanks for listening. And I'll be happy to take any questions with a couple minutes we have left. Thank you, Jason. And we do have a couple minutes left. I want to make sure that Jason gets the full time that he had. So um, if anyone has any questions. Well, Jason, I have I have one for you before you um, and here, will you put the link to the verification web page in the chat? I think um, people may want to see the web page you showed, so that might be a good, a good thing. Sure. Just give me a second here. Okay. Well, Jason, I'm going to let you do that. Um, okay. And uh, if anyone has any questions for Jason, um, after the fact, please put them in the chat. Um, he can answer them later. And next up, we're going to go back to our first speaker, which is Harveer Singh from NCMRWF. And he'll be presenting utilization of the MET package for verification of deterministic forecasts at NCMRWF.
I can hear you, but you're very, very low. It's hard to, it, we can't fully hear what you're saying. Okay. Presentation is visible. Yeah, we can't really hear you and um, we can't see your screen if you're sharing it right now. Well, I'm going to come back. Um, we might be having some technical difficulties. This is really for the DTC group. Um, what would you like us to do now? We could move on to Marion Mittermeier. We could wait a second. What would you, what would DTC like? Um, Marion, are you ready to present? Yes, I can be. <laughs> Thank you, Marion, for being uh, Johnny on the spot. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I can do that. Let me. Maybe we'll try and have Harvey um, go into a separate Google Meet session and try and sort out his yeah, difficulties. Well, I can okay. do that. I can send him an email and, and connect. Mm -hmm. okay, Let's thank you. see if I can share. Well, while you're doing that, Marion, I'll introduce you. So our next speaker is Marion Mittermeier from the Met Office, and she'll be presenting progress with application and implementation of Met Plus at the Met Office. Can you see my screen at all? Yeah, it's not in presentation mode yet, okay. but I can Is it now? Yes, awesome. Okay, all right, that looks good. Let me see if I can find a pointer. Right. Okay. Well, that's that will teach me to stay awake. Um, uh, well, afternoon, uh, um, evening for people online, um, and I guess good morning as well. Um, I'd like to um, share with you some of the progress we've made with the application of um, and the implementation of um, Met Plus at the Met Office. First of all, I guess one of the most important things to mention here is that the Met Office as an organization and science-wise is undergoing a cube sphere revolution. Um, and so the fact that we're going down the route uh, of, you know, changing the dynamical core and the definition of our grids, um, which is called ALFRIC for those who don't know, um, and also the introduction and advent of global kilometer scale modeling really does change everything for us. Um, and why does it change everything? Well, we need the tools to be able to handle these massive data sets where we're talking about billions of uh, grip points um, and also the fact that it's no longer a regular grid. And so the Met Office has embarked on a huge activity to, in the first instance, um, develop a, a, our plotting and visualization capability called IRIS. And it's one of the reasons we, we, we initially uh, went down the route of Met Plus because we need to um, re rejuvenate our um, model evaluation capability as well. The other reason is that tools really don't develop or maintain themselves and, um, you know, carrying the, the burden of this development um, at a single institutional level is really quite difficult. So community development of codes is, is really the way forward, um, albeit that we know that it comes with opportunities, but also a few challenges, which I'll try and touch on in a minute. So at the Met Office, we have the Next Generation Modeling System or NGMS program. And under that umbrella, we have a Next Generation Verification Project. The decision to adopt Met Plus was made way back in 2019. And um, we started the project around August 2019. So we're coming up to just about two years in. And there are many different components to this, but it also includes um, a firm, you know, contractual link between us and the DTC to help us, um, you know, plug some of the development gaps that we identify as we go along. And I will touch on some of these um, already. I'm not going to uh, go over some of the things that Tara and others have already said. 
What I do want to touch on, because it's proving to be an increasingly important component of at least our initial prototype system, is the IRIS capability, which is a, um, a, a library which the Met Office uh, has on GitHub, which has recently been extended to provide capability to support the U-Grid or unstructured grid um, convention, uh, which an extension or, a, yeah, I guess you could call it an extension to the CF compliant net CDF um, uh, format structure or framework. Um, and we know uh, from what we see that it will it will form the basis of everything that a scientist in the Met Office will do going forward when it comes to evaluating and diagnosing model errors and evaluation. And it provides a very comprehensive way of enabling us to actually visualize the forecast data on the U-grid before regridding, in addition to providing the ability to regrid. So I'm going to kind of uh, kind of start with the conclusions first. So where are we at um, at this point, and then I'll unpack it a little bit. So to date, um, we now have um, extended the prototype Rose Suite, which is our scheduler system of Rose and Silk, um, to optimally combine MetPlus wrappers with Silk into a cycling proto verification suite that is running routinely for the regular gridded UM model verification against analysis, and it's shadowing the operational verification suite, um, though I stress it's not yet running on the HPC. Um, this includes um, the, the steps for doing the PP, or which is the Met Office proprietary format to net CDF conversion um, for nine of our models. Um, uh, although not all of those models have been implemented yet, we're incrementally adding the, the verification apps for all these models. But four of them are currently fully verified, and that includes the global model. Um, and it's quite a lot that we do for the global model, just against analyses, you know, four times a day, it's running processing 76 scalars and 25 vector fields for 24 cast ranges per cycle over 25 different areas, as well as the CBS grid two and grid three grids. Um, just a word on the PP files because it's come up. Um, obviously, the PP file is a MetOffice proprietary format that will be deprecated when the UM is retired. So we're not planning to do any work to, to work towards the PP format. We're choosing or making the decision to embrace the conversion up until the point that Alfric goes live, which will be net CDF by default. Just some output from that, um, just to show that we, you know, we've got some verification stats running um, already. A key part of that was decision, the decision how and when we implement Met Plus, and a key bit of work that one of my colleagues, Joe Abram, did was to actually work out what this optimal combination of um, of tools looks like, and that hence was the Proto Suite that has now been extended. And in short, it basically allows the interaction between um, the MetPlus wrappers and the rosesuite.conf files, which enables the cycling and the interaction between the two to occur. Another key thing that we've done is we have our own ver, uh, ver, ver, Python-based visualization um, tool called Verpy, um, and Met has been uh, interfaced with Verpy in, in, in that it's been implemented as a system, and we can um, directly read um, Met output in Verpy and then use our standard plotting tools. There are still many questions that we need to resolve here, um, notably how do we go forward with our station-based um, database, which goes back to 1997 or so, and obviously something we will want to to keep going. So now onto some of the contributions and some of the details that we have um, worked on over the last two, almost two years or so. A significant contribution that the Met Office has made to the, the, the code, even though it's a small contribution, but I think it's significant, is the introduction, introduction of OpenMP um, to the fractional stats loops in grid stat. And this was done by Math Glover and the testing was done by Rachel North. And at the bottom line is that the introduction of OpenMP has led to about a 50% speed up. And 
by math's own admission, um, the, the, the additions to the code to enable this were relatively small and there is scope to do a lot more. But um, given that we use the fractional skill score an awful lot in the Met Office, uh, we need this code to be um, highly optimized. In fact, it's the only code that has been parallelized within our existing system. But yeah, 50% speed up as a first uh, step change is, is, is really impressive. Um, just a couple of things around how he did that. Um, he specifically looked at virtual threading as well and noticed that, you know, that doesn't, so-called hyper-threading, doesn't actually um, eventually give you any, any, any benefits. Um, and then he specifically looked at the grid stat total run and tried to um, define the, 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 the proportion of time that uh, the code spends in serial and in parallel bits of code. Um, and effectively, his timing tests when he ran it on the desktop showed that once he'd um, made the, the did, added the code, 73% of the time was in parallel and only 27% in serial. And that time was just slightly different when he did some tests on our HPC. Um, but it was quite a small sample. Nevertheless, I think he, um, he's made a considerable amount of the time being shifted from serial into parallel. What we need to do uh, in our organization, and then Jason has also alluded to, is we have to reconcile the old uh, and the new. And um, on the face of it, that sounds pretty simple. In reality, it's a harder task than we might have guessed. Um, we need these results to agree. Uh, not just when we upgrade models, but you know we we have long histories of 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 scores, and we don't really want to have some really horrible looking step changes in long time series of performance. Um, but what we've really come to conclude is that we <laughs> there are some fundamental differences that have arisen between assuming that you're using grib files by default and net CDF, and another one which may surprise people is the fact that the convention differences between C++ and Fortran, uh, whether you're indexing from north to south or south to north, can have some pretty interesting um, effects. And basically, we've adopted a process whereby, you know, if we see big differences, we need to try to understand where they're coming from. And then, we, you know, we need to decide whether they can be changed or fixed or whether we have to accept them. One such example is the work that um, Seb Cole did around uh, the application and, well, the generation first instance and then the application of masks from GenVX mask, um, which led to very curious 4% uh, differences in RMSE scores, for example, over some of the regions. And this was essentially because we were not identifying the same, same number of grip points in the masks that we have in our old system and the one that GenVX mask creates. Um, and uh, that was then traced back to uh, what I just alluded to, differences in conve uh, conventions between whether you're indexing from south to north or north to south, which affects which, which grip points you might be getting to first um, when you're interpolating, for example. And our solution to try and get the grip points equal was to extend the areas by an additional 0.6 degrees um, to try and get the same number of grip points, as you can see um, on this plot on the top right here. Eventually, when we extend the area, we can get the number of observations or the number of grip points to be the same. And then we can get the, the, the RMSEs to match to within about 2%. But the changes or the differences in the interpolation and the direction of travel mean that we couldn't get them to be the same. Uh, and basically what we've kind of concluded with all of this is that this is one of those where we now understand where the differences come from. Um, they're probably not fixable just because of the fundamentals of C++ versus um, Fortran, and we will just have to kind of make a decision about extending the areas to reduce the differences. Something else that we kind of relates to the fact that the, the, some things were tested in GRIB and then didn't quite work in NetCDF is the, the rotated poll capability. 
um, which we found was uh, well needed needed seeing to, as well as uh, a rota an additional capability around PCP combine, not supporting the subtraction of T plus naught, for example, which has been added since. And so the good news is that you know with some of those changes, working with the DTC colleagues, we can now you know uh, check that and you know actually produce the same results when we use external software to um, PCP combine. Just a couple of things around fraction skill score because I alluded to it earlier. Um, you know, there are a number of things um, around this yet that we're kind of looking at and the steps are probably a little bit more cumbersome than we want right now and we haven't fully integrated the wrappers and all the steps um, in a quite a slick way as we want. Effectively, we're still doing a lot of things, um, you know, in sort of discrete steps rather than, you know, doing them in a more joined up way. But we have all the different components working. So that's the first step that I'd like to say that we're quite happy with. Um, and in, that includes the regridding, um, you know, extracting subdomains and, and putting it all together. Um, and here's just an example of that. And this is also the data we used to test um, the OpenMP code. And here is just some examples where we also illustrate the use of the F bias equals to one uh, flag um, to kind of create um, uh, the biased um, fields for before we compute the scores, which all works very nicely. And here we show an example of how that's integrated with the verpi plotting. A couple of example applications. Um, first of all, uh, some examples from um, uh, ocean data with class four data, which is really important. This is what um, ocean forecasting centers exchange and colleague Rick Cocker has been working to integrate that with stat analysis using the NPR files, because that's kind of what we get from some of the centers. Um, we don't have the full forecast field, so we're having different entry points. Um, and that also includes doing some profiles, which is um, work that's going well, and they're working on developing a, uh, you know, a, an ocean verification suite, which is going well. Um, some examples of uh, TC precipitation verification. Um, um, a colleague, Helen Titley, um, presented some of this work at a recent WCSSP workshop in, with Indian partners. But Rachel North has been very helpful in putting this together, but effectively looking at precipitation objects from TCs from an ensemble system, or is it two different ensemble systems, if I'm not mistaken, um, and also uh, you know, then analyzing the object attributes from these systems. Marion, um, Marion you have about a minute and a half left, just okay, so you know. Thanks. Um, and so there we have uh, a lot of different stats that we can have also analyzing the size of the objects colored by area and intensity. A couple of other things I think mentioned already, chlorophyll um, and also grid diag stats for seasonal or sub-seasonal sub forecasts and some examples of how we've used series analysis for lightning. Some sticking points to conclude. Um, the old paradigm of living in a really nice structured world is, is I think well and truly broken uh, as we go forward and to an unstructured world. Um, and I think there's a key challenge here of making MET more flexible to handle UGRID internally. Um, and everything we've sort of discussed in the last six months or so suggests this is not going to be easy. We are making progress, um, but I think there is still a lot of work to do because the things we're making progress on are working back towards a gridded field, which we then can push through MET and MET Plus with no problems. Um, anything that we want to do on the native grid or when we want to extract a native grid point and compare it to an ob location, well, there is still some work to do. I think we've got some solutions on the table, um, but I think it may still be some time before the regridding and interpolation would be internalized within MET to cope with the U-grid. Um, and just an example why this is potentially important, regridding doesn't solve all your problems. 
um, or you can get all sorts of fantastic artifacts when you um, regrid a what is an Alfric field and then you take the difference from the Alfric field with um, a standard re a regular grid UM. And finally, just observations also are a sticky point, um, but we have made progress recently uh, using Python embedding uh, and our locally compiled ODB libraries, because the Met Office uses ODBs um, to extract the observations required within a point stat job. And here is just an example of some recent up, um, you know, progress where we're showing that we're getting the observations out, but they don't agree with what we get out of our current system at the moment. And they can't really agree at the moment because they're not really quite agree. You know, they're not designed to agree, but it shows that we're making progress. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Marion. Um, I'll read, I think there's a question in the chat. I'll read it out loud. It says, "Okay." Um, Marion, based on your presentation, would you say the differences you are seeing between Met Plus and your legacy system are good examples of why all operational centers should consider using the same verification framework when comparing their scores to other scores? I would say yes, um, because I think it's quite, um, you know, if I just think about the CVS scores, which is basically what we were looking at here, um, you know, the CBS documents don't say, you know, which language you should use or how you go about it. They do specify, you know, a lot. But beyond that, what we're seeing is <laughs> there's a lot more that can, simple, you know, there's a lot more subtleties that um, come into play and that will change the numbers. Um, so, yes, I think it's a very good case for that. And then um, another question from the chat. This one's from Robert Craig. It says, is the Met Office still using Hira? I, sorry for it. It's H-I-R-A. Yeah. Hira. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think we have time for one more quick, if there's anything else. Not maybe um, uh, just really quickly. Hira stands for high res resolution analysis. assessment. Yeah. Assessment. Sorry. I, Marian, do you want to give a just a, a two second um, a quick coverage of, of what Hira is? Uh, yeah, sure. So it's just a it's a, a spatial way of uh, verifying high resolution models at point observations. So you extract a neighborhood for um, well, you know forecast neighborhood around the observing location to to verify um, you know against the point observation, trying to account for some of the double penalty problems primarily. Thank you, Marion. Um, okay. So I'll stop I'm not sure and... who we should go to next <laughs> because I'm not sure that Elizabeth Satter Satterfield is here. I'm here. Yep. Oh, you are here. Ah, oh, yeah. Liz Satterfield. That's, there it is. There it is. Yeah, well, so um, Har Harger it has been... Um, officially tested out um he switched his um headset and 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 so forth so why don't we go with harvey okay okay that sounds Thanks. good okay. so our next um speaker is harvey singh um from ncm rwf presenting on the utilization of met packages for verification on deterministic forecasts at ncm RWF. am i already one yep slide is moving yes Thank you. Okay, thank you for giving me the chance. So I'm uh, today presenting the utilization of MAT package over for the verification of determinants forecast at uh, CMA WF. So uh, there are some uh, outlines of MAT plus status at NCMA WF and data I'm using here, running mode uh, and contribution options and uh, impact of uh, some smoothing radius and some optional products. So here uh, the status of uh, Mat, Mat plus uh, here. So uh, Mat uh, version 10 is installed and uh, Mat plus 4.0.0 installed at NCMA WF3 system that we are also uh, 5.75. So tools uh, I'm basically using, uh, uh, to, uh, these tools I have used uh, earlier also, but right now I'll focus on, on mode only. So uh, like uh, 
credit data point uh, ascii data buffer data and uh, pcp combined uh, so these some uh, tools i have already used so board analysis and uh, uh, board today I'll, I'll be focusing on that so data i have used here is a integrated uh, multi satellite retrieval uh, from gpm that is imarts data this is available half hourly 0.1 degree by 0 0.23 and it is accumulated uh, uh, daily 0 utc to 0 3 utc to 0 3 utc in natcdf format and uh, uh, the uh, and these, i have used this data for the multi models uh, like uh, uh, um it's unified model uh, for tensor model of NCM, UKMO, uh, GFS, and set GFS, and this is the data for uh, 2021. Yes, so uh, running mode actually, uh, yeah, this is uh, the command line and uh, the output uh, I uh, we got uh, like this. And and the configuration options uh, here I have used uh, for these things. So, uh, convolution radius, uh, just I put uh, like uh, two uh, grid squares uh, and the convolution thresholds uh, 20 greater than 20 millimeter, greater than equal to 20 millimeter, 40, 80, 40, 60, 80, 100, and 120. Same for the observations. So, here the fuzzy logic engines, also the matching flags uh, for the both uh, march uh, and uh, the maximum center distance is. Uh, it, 800 by uh, grid resolution. So here is grid resolution is uh, 10 kilometer. So this is the one example from uh, there uh, at the uh, 120 hour forecast. Uh, so some events is happen over this uh, east uh, eastern parts of India, and it is uh, very well picked up and uh, masked here. So this is the forecast object with the observ observation of outline, and uh, it's giving uh, the statistics uh, here. Now, uh, the, for the multi models, uh, uh, this one product from the uh, mode is like the NCM is predicting up to day five these, uh, these events, and the UKMO also predicted. But uh, IMD GFS uh, is uh, uh, slightly missing for after day three. Uh, day two, it is there, but slightly uh, eastward or uh, north, north eastward. So, NSAP GFS and the ECNWF also picking this event. At the uh, 16 millimeter of uh, rainfall. So, uh, some stats I computed from uh, there, and uh, this is the central distance I compared for the for, for 2021. So, uh, uh, first one is uh, 20 uh, millimeter of uh, rainfall, and the uh, second uh, panel, uh, second row is uh, 80 millimeters rainfall. So, here we can say uh, we we have the uh, central distance is uh, minimum is showing up to uh, day five uh, for the uh, we have unified model installed at uh, NC model where but uh, in case of uh, 80 millimeter it is uh, in uh, 24 hour forecast it is slightly higher than uh, uh, than UKMO and uh, that's okay. okay so finally the total interest also computed uh, for uh, for uh, these things so this type of uh, uh, Statistics uh, we are generating in NCMA WF. Uh, it's, uh, oh, uh, okay, so this is the total interest for the 2021. Uh, and and mode summary also we are generating here. So oh, this uh, kind of things. And uh, so here is uh, one uh, example that is shown for the August 2021. So here's for August 30. One number of files processed uh, and the number of uh, single objects and the number of forecast objects uh, we have uh, I have plotted here using R. So uh, and another uh, used case is uh, here is the impact of a smoothing radius for the one cyclone case. So here we can have the if uh, we are having the five uh, or we can say the increasing uh, convolution radius. So it's, it's a smoothing. No. So it is giving uh, impact like this. Uh, center distance is uh, in, uh, decreasing, increasing convolution radius, and uh, total interest is uh, increasing, it's increasing uh, this total uh, convolution radius. So these are the some operational products uh, in the internal web of NCMA WF. For, so, so these products uh, as uh, for the multimodal, uh, you can say. NCM, UKMO, and IMD, GFS, NSF, GFS. Uh, these are daily updating on website. Some other products also we would like to uh, have uh, some graphic. 
some time few for power so this is uh, are the feature plans for the implementation of mac plus other tools uh, whatever uh, which are we are going to implement then the the mat plot pi and mat cal pi to calculate then plot the certain matrix such as commonly used in this is mat viewer and mat express user interface score card generation and etc so thank you this is from my side Thank you, Javier. Um, we have time for questions. If anyone has any they'd like to ask out loud or maybe put in the chat. Tara. Yeah, I, I may have missed this, Javier, but um mode are you running that routinely like um operationally um the use of mode for your evaluation or is that more for just case studies yeah it is uh, operationally running daily on daily basis in ncmrwf for the four models four models that is ukmo okay uh, um model at uh, ncmrwf imb gfs and nsep gfs along with the regional model also for the uh, unified model Okay. And um, are you uh, are you thinking about using um, like the tool mode time domain at all? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. things through time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to use that mode time domain. In, in future plan, it is there. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much for showing, um, you know, the configurations and, and everything. I think that that's going to be very helpful for people when they review the, the slides in the future. So thanks. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Harvier while we while we have him here? Oh, Harvier, there's one in the, in the chat. I'll read it to you. Um, I am GFS and NCEP GFS. Which is better for I think precipitation forecasts? Harvier, if you're answering, you're on mute. But you might not be answering. So sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Uh, for some cases, uh, IMD GFS is showing uh, for some events uh, some good forecast. So it's uh, uh, we can say sometime it's uh, answer GFS. Most probably some events uh, very well picked up by uh, IMD GFS. And for those that don't know, um, NCEP also compares both those models on our web pages. So the link that Jason put in earlier in the chat can lead you to uh, graphics that show both of those as well. All right. Um, another question in the chat, it's from Helen. It says, do you tend to use GPM, um, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not great with the acronyms. <laughs> imager okay. early or late in your verification or the imager uh, final, which is the final product. Okay, from uh, uh, 2020 onwards, uh, I'm using this uh, IMERS data. IMD, uh, IMD also, India Meteorological Department is also providing uh, that data, and that is uh, 25 kilometer resolutions. But IMERS data is at 10 kilometer resolutions. So our model uh, at uh, uh, 12 kilometer resolution, so we prefer uh, going to this one. I must from last year onwards. Helen, tell you, did you got answer? I think so, but um, if not, maybe Helen can can touch base with you again. Okay. Okay, any and last call for questions for Hervier before we move on? Excellent, thank you very much. Um, okay, so our next speaker and our final speaker, who is actually the only speaker speaking in their slot in this session, so thank you for your patience, <laughs> is, <laughs> is Elizabeth Satterfield from NRL, and she'll be presenting an update on the use of MET Plus at the Naval Research Laboratory. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen here.
So hopefully you can hear me and see my screen and I am in presenter mode. We're not seeing it in presenter mode. You're not seeing um, it in presenter mode. Okay. Try again. Are you now? Uh, it's still got the slides on the side for us. Unfortunate. Let me see. Try reading mode. Does that work oh, that looks, better? That looks good for us. Okay. Can you click forward one just to make sure it advances? And then we'll sure. be good. Yep, it worked. Okay. Excellent. We'll go Thank with you. that. Okay, great. So I am overviewing the use of MET at the uh, Naval Research Laboratory um, with a focus on the work being done in Monterey. So this is a, a focus on atmospheric models. Um, I wanted to start just with this very basic schematic uh, just to motivate our choice to, to move to using the MET Plus infrastructure. Um, so this is sort of just detailing how we go from observations uh, to what our, our main motivation is at the Naval Research, Research Lab to uh, provide information to planners, decision makers, and warfighters. So you're seeing here, let me see if I can get a, I guess I can't get a pointer. Can you see my, uh, my pointer on the screen? Here? Yeah, yeah, we Hopefully. can see your mouse. Great. So uh, what you're seeing here is the ingest of observations uh, into this box of data assimilation to create initial conditions, and that feeds back into the forecast model. Um, the forecast model output is used for guidance products, and these could be uh, post-processed um, or include uh, additional statistics or machine learning methods. Um, and then finally into uh, downstream modeling systems or uh, tactical decision aids. And what I'm showing here uh, with the double arrows is that each of these systems uh, needs a verification and validation system. And the double arrows are really meant to indicate that this is iterative. So uh, we apply verification and we go back and we tune these systems, but they also feed into each other. So if these are separate systems, it is really a uh, hindrance in not only workflow, um, but also in communication. And this was brought up a little bit in uh, Marion's talk that you can get some minor differences that can really hinder communications, not only between us and the community, but also in different models, between different models that we run and the bounding or parent system. So uh, a brief outline of this talk, I'll speak a little bit more about, about motivation and overview the uh, efforts at NRL uh, to use MET, discuss our strategy for expanding the use, um, as well as our contributions to MET Plus, and uh, briefly discuss some challenges and future applications. Um, so a bit of orientation here on the left is uh, listing the uh, the NRL atmospheric models. Um, so we've got NavGem. This is our uh, global model. Um, like other NWP centers, we are moving to a unified modeling system. Uh, the first implementation of that will be global. This is our Neptune model. This will be replacing NavGem and be the basis of a unified prediction system. There's also COAMPS, our regional model, and the coupled system, Navy ESPC, as well as NAPS, that's our aerosol analysis and prediction system. So our aim here is to uh, create a verification framework that's consistent across these models and also consistent with our operational partners as well as the community. Um, and in addition, uh, as, as Marion had also alluded to, uh, being able to go to um, more, more modern capabilities, um, be able to go towards native grids, make use of more modern feature-based metrics, allow us to grow our, our verification database uh, with help from the community. And this will help us better tailor our verification products 
um, to the needs of development and also the, the needs of the end user of these systems. Okay, so our traditional workflow, um, you're seeing this very simple schematic here. Uh, we ingest the uh, output files from various models, uh, deterministic ensemble, global mesoscale, so forth. Um, we are verifying against uh, observations, typically conventional, um, also self-analyses and uh, analyses from different uh, centers. Um, these will go into diagnostic packages, create a temporary output, and that will be the basis of uh, various visualization uh, and, and scorecard plots. Um, so traditionally, these have been uh, separate packages, and I've, I've highlighted in red here some of the uh, characteristics of these systems that we hope to improve going to a more unified framework. Um, and uh, so we hope to get to uh, a more consistent verification across models. Um, and, and this can help communication between models allow us to understand how changes in a parent model impact a downstream model. Um, and also expand the metrics beyond just what's in the, the basic scorecard to be able to look at statistics of interests from uh, the forcing or bounding model. Okay, so to do that, um, we, we are implementing uh, MET and uh, the components of, of MET Plus are listed here on the left. I have highlighted the components that are being used at NRL to some extent and grade out what we are not using. Um, the main component that we are using is MET, um, and this is just providing the, the core statistical tool. I've highlighted that in the orange box here. So all of our calculations have now translated to MET, that's providing our uh, ASCII output and some uh, spatial plots. Uh, we are heavily using MET. Um, the uh, routines used include uh, grid stat, point stat, ensemble stat, TC stat, stat analysis. Um, and this is providing all of our calculations and temporary output. And those are then actually fed into our own visualization and scorecard display system. I'll say more about that in later slides, uh, but we are using our own display rather than net viewer. Uh, the way that we have implemented this, um, we are heavily leveraging container builds, specifically using singularity to deploy MET tools on DOD HPCs. Um, we have been using, instead of MET plus wrappers, our, our own uh, NRL developed wrappers simply to, uh, at the start, limit complexity um, and dependencies when we're running on, on HPCs and running in line with the model, um, and also facilitate running from a singularity container uh, and Python embedding. We are currently looking into uh, how to best use uh, MET wrappers and if that can add value uh, to the system. Um, and as I mentioned, instead of using MET viewer, we have linked uh, our visualization uh, system, which we call ADS for Automated Diagnostic System. Uh, this does facilitate some backwards compatibility with the legacy system. Uh, and provide the infrastructure to do the comparison between old and new systems. We also have a singularity build of this that uh, we are able to deploy on HPCs. So these pieces are all tied together with the Silk workflow, and I'll give you a schematic of how that works. Um, so all of the blue pieces here are pieces that have been replaced with a, a unified system. Uh, I'll say a few words about uh, observations or fields that are going into this. Um, to uh, use a, a unified observation feed, right now we are leveraging the observations that are ingested into the data assimilation systems. And these are either what are called innovation files for NavGem 
and going into Yoda files that are fed into the Jedi-based DA for uh, Neptune. So those files, uh, DTC has helped us with ingest of those, um, and that is built on ASCII to NCE to create a, a NetCDF ingestible file. Uh, we are moving towards a model agnostic pre-processing system. This will be an H5 file that we will read in with Python embedding. So Met, has, Met Plus and Met has replaced the standardized calculations uh, in the middle. Um, we are using Python embedding for most of our model fields and uh, our grid-to-grid uh, -grid comparisons. Um, and now we're creating a temporary output that is standardized. So all of these components are running under the Silk Suite and are run uh, in line with the model um, and uh, are run for each, each model cycle point. And then either at the end of that cycle or at some uh, set intervals, then we're doing visualization that can be done with MET tools or internally developed tools or fed into our uh, existing ADS system. Um, I'll say a few words about just comparison to our legacy verification. Uh, like the Met Office and others, we have to, to do this, this apples to apples comparison and look at uh, any differences that are arising when you go to a new verification system. Um, so some of the plots you're looking at here uh, on the left is just RMS for deterministic. This is uh, 500 hectopascal geopotential, and then for the ensemble system, looking at CRPS for 10 meter wind speed. Um, so uh, like others, we do see differences here. Um, Marion had mentioned some fundamental differences with just the code bases. Um, most of these differences are explainable to us. Most of the major differences that we're seeing are explainable to us um, by uh, differences in grid weighting, latitude weighting, um, and differences in interpolation. Uh, we have gotten to a point where we have compared and reproduced the global scorecard. We are at an acceptable level of difference. Um, so we will target uh, the model transition to Neptune for uh, switching over to Met for our operational verification. Uh, a few words about just capabilities that are enabled by looking at, uh, by using a, a unified verification system and having that unification across models. We are able to now um, better compare multiple models that are, are run at NRL. And this allows us to address questions like, how does NAPGEM, the global model, at some specific resolution compare with the regional model for a specific time or a place or a threshold value? Um, you're seeing the, uh, the masking region, some of the masking regions shown on the top right here in blue, um, and some of the output from ADS. This is a, a snippet from our scorecard. Um, as well as what we call our box plots. So you're looking at pressure level uh, by lead time, and these are just regional averages. Um, so we can look at these comparisons and uh, be able to better use computational resources and answer questions that are uh, specific to a need. Um, we're also able to easily tailor our metrics to a specific problem of interest or um, needs of the end user. This might be a specific threshold value or uh, using observations from a specific field campaign. Um, we've done a bit with object-based verification using mode. Uh, this was a collaboration with DTC that we used uh, mode to look at objects of uh, NavGen Cloud here on the bottom left, objects in the forecast versus the verification. We tested various parameters to set up mode uh, for both global and regional domains. That's what you're seeing in the table here. Um, this is also a plot of just interest values that's giving us a similar similarity between the forecast and observation object by lead time. So these are results that 
are uh, going forward and being used in other applications and other projects now. Um, extension to high altitude. So this uh, is a case where we have extended our diagnostics to the uh, the middle atmosphere model. This is called NAVGEM AJ. Um, and the point I wanted to make with uh, this slide is just to indicate the ease in which we were able to extend these diagnostics, that this was just a one-line change in a config file, um, which is a which was a much easier task than it would have been with our uh, traditional uh, statistics package uh, that was a Fortran-based system. Um, we were also able to transition uh, some ensemble diagnostics to our operational partner, that's Fleet Numerical, um, and what they wanted was to extend their capabilities to be able to include threshold and probabilistic based metrics. So we were able to transition to them um, the receiver operating characteristics, ignorance score, prior score, and right frequency histograms for thresholds uh, that uh, are of naval importance, um, specifically 10 meter wind speed and 34 knot winds. Uh, but in doing this, they also got the benefit of being able to uh, replace their uh, traditional ensemble statistics package with the, the MET-based unified framework. Um, Liz, just wanted to let you know, two minutes. Thanks. Uh, so here's a, another application um, of ensemble stat. This has been extended to the ensemble uh, ensemble based DA and forecast for the aerosol model maps. Um, so you're looking at some reliability diagrams here for thresholds of 0.5 and 0.08 by lead time. Um, and uh, uh, it was mentioned in the first session that we did make a contribution to MET in terms of the forecast difficulty index. So this is a decision based diagnostic which is basically giving you um, a, a graphical illustration of the difficulty uh, in making a forecast-based decision on a specific threshold. So how hard would it be to make a go, no-go decision based on, you're looking at a five-day forecast of 20-knot wind speed um, on the left or nine-foot waves on the right? And this is just represented uh, graphically as, as red, green, yellow. So it can give you a spatial idea of how hard that decision would be. Um, and this, this was transitioned to MET+. Plus. Um, a few words on just uh, maybe specific challenges and issues. Um, NRL models do not typically produce output that is natively red. So we do have to uh, uh, do our own uh, Python embedding scripts um, and that does give us some limitation. Uh, there have been some limitations in things like the calculation of uh, vector wind RMS. Uh, that's a, I think that's an open issue on GitHub right now. Um, and uh, I should also mention um, that Marion had brought on the issue of uh, being able to do verification on native grids. That would be a, a, a great development for NRL as well. Um, the deployment is straightforward if we're using containers, uh, specifically Singularity. Um, in practice, we are using our own wrappers um, but, and our own uh, self suites, but we're assessing how we can best use uh, some of the additional capabilities that could be offered by um, MetPlus as well as uh, MetCalcPy, MetPlotPy, and so forth. Um, We've uh, discussed at the Met governance meetings, uh, a container build would allow us to make better use of Met Viewer. Um, and uh, just to mention, Met is developing as we are. So not maybe not everything that we need to apply to all models is there at this point, but we're keeping an eye on what's in the pipeline as that develops um, and, and able to, to help inform that development as well. Um, there is a learning curve. We are working on expanding our in-house expertise, but in general, we've had great support from DTC uh, in terms of online documentation, tutorials, GitHub discussions. And uh, in the old times pre-pandemic, we were able to hold two in-person training sessions 
uh, John and Tara and George came out, um, and that was really great to get uh, some of the books at NRL spun up on that. Um, so I'll just, uh, this is my last slide. This is not meant to be an eye chart, but just showing you the uh, model application on the left here um, and going from left to right, looking at completed or current milestones planned and potential. So a lot of work currently has been done with the global system. Um, and as we move forward, more is being done with EMEO and aerosol as well as TC. Uh, and we're looking forward to go uh, um, forward with the coupled system uh, as well as uh, additional use of feature-based diagnostics. So I will stop there and take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Somehow, miraculously, we are back on time. So we do have time for some questions. Um, if you have any in the chat or um, you can raise your hand. Yes, Marion. Hi, Liz. Thanks for that. Um, specifically a question, um, I think obviously the tripolar grid is really important for you, but are there any other unstructured grids that, that you have with your modeling systems? Is it a cube sphere or what, 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 what kind of grid is it? Yeah, so going forward to uh, Neptune, that is a cube sphere grid. Um, mm. So that is one capability that we'd be quite interested in. Um, uh, and that is aligned with with what you guys are doing at the Met Office, um, mm -hmm. that being able to do that verification uh, on a cube sphere grid would, would be very uh, beneficial. And the us. tripolar as well? Um, that would, yes, that would be as well. Yeah, 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 it's, it seems like it's not trivial. <laughs> yeah. As, as I'm learning, yeah. uh, as we've been learning, but yeah, I think, as we've also been looking at you know examining those differences um yeah there are some interesting aliasing effects from having the cube sphere which you wouldn't necessarily want to just always interpolate away because when you're trying to do the model development you can't actually see what's going on at the grip point level right um so yeah that's kind of why you know you could say on on a sort of an operational model uh, evaluation or verification perspective probably what we do when we just put everything on the regular grid is all very good and well and probably sufficient in most instances but when you get into the guts of model development um, that's when it really becomes very clear that that's not sufficient so, and that really is a key goal here to be able to use this verification in a way that we can inform um, model development and yeah. also inform data assimilation yeah um, and which is done on the native mostly on yeah, the which native is, grid yeah for so, for neptune it will be yep yeah yeah so um, yeah anyway i think there's some common ground there which i think we should absolutely. continue to explore <laughs> And so for us right now, and I don't know if it's different for you, for us right now, we are actually um, using, uh, so when we run the model, that output is being post-processed um, by, uh, by model developed interpolation methods to output on a regular grid, which is then being mm. fed into the verification. Liz, um, I have two more questions for you real quick before we before we sign off, if that's OK. Great. One came in in the chat and it's from John Kelly and it says, is NRL using or planning to use MET Plus for ocean model forecast guidance evaluation? Uh, TBD. There's a lot of interest in that right now. Um, and uh, the it's not being used currently, but there's a lot of interest in going there. Um, those are our colleagues down at Simmons, Mississippi. Uh, that are doing the ocean modeling and ocean verification. So a lot of interest up and coming there um, and uh, that will be to be determined. Okay, no, that sounds good. For the record, we are at EMC. We're using uh, MET Plus for our TOFS verification. And Great. Bindin, uh, you raised your hand and I think you're gonna be the last question. Yes, I'd like to uh, ask a question about the uh, joint model verification. Uh, so is joint model verification is uh, 
in the model verification process or in the uh, plotting process? Sorry, I didn't quite ca catch that question. Can you just repeat that? My question is that in, uh, in your size that you uh, have a joint model verification. You are right. Under, so is this joint model is uh, during the uh, verification process or after verification you got states and then put states of different model in the plotting process? So what I was trying to indicate by joint verification is simply being able to take the output of the global model and the regional model and run verification the same metrics with the same system on the same observations. So I'm not necessarily talking about a, a coupled application, but being able to do that verification jointly across models. All right. Well, thank you very much, Liz, and thank you everyone for coming. I want to echo Mallory's comments in the chat. It is very, very exciting to see different centers um, using MetPlus in this way. Um, so I think it's time for a break, I believe, Tara, and we will come back at 2.30 Eastern, 12.30 Mountain, whatever time it is where you are, <laughs> we will be back. Um, thank you very much. And, well, and, and before people drop off, um, we're also going to take this uh, hour to um, have some do something fun. Um, do a Slido um, survey. What are your favorite MetPlus tools? So if you go to Slido.com and um, just enter this number, um, it'll take you to the survey. And then um, as we're coming back from lunch, I'll I'll pop up a, a word cloud with that. And I'm I'm putting the link to it in this chat. We'll be returning back to this um, Google Meet session. So if you want to just leave it up, um, feel free to do so. Thank you. <laughs>